Today, we're burying our doctors, our smartest, most experienced, most educated people in paperwork and asking them to do things that they can do, but it's a waste of their talent. And what we want to do is use technology to automate that, put people back in charge and empower not just people, what we call health consumers, but also physicians to make them more productive. One, it's a sick care system. So there's an opportunity to create a system of health and care. Two, we have a cost problem. And, you know, that's, it costs too much. Um, three, we have a problem of information and quality. So all those are challenges. If you can come up with a solution that's better, then you can build a company around it. And as, as you look at it, if you survey people in the United States, what they would say is there is a $4 trillion spend growing to $6 trillion. And the interesting thing about healthcare is you can't solve the healthcare problem. Impossible. So why do I say that? Hey, Glenn, how are you? I'm feeling well. All is good. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Awesome. So let's just get into it. So who is Glenn Tulmer? Who are you? Sure. Um, well, I've been fortunate. Uh, I'm a, kind of known as a serial entrepreneur, and uh, I've been fortunate to start and run a number of public-private companies across the United States and some operating internationally. And uh, I am also a social anthropologist by training. And most important, I'm uh, a father to uh, three uh, grown uh, kids who are all doing well and off on their own explorations. So um, that's that's a quick overview of who I am. Uh, so I think uh, I'll take a step back here. You Everything you've done till now has been in healthcare. Um, most companies that you've built have been in the healthcare industry. So what what is healthcare? Sure, I think health care, so we actually refer to it as health and care as opposed to health care because if you think about it, it's really the act of what we try to do is keep people healthy. And, um, you know, that's the, the goal. And so health care really refers to um, our sick care system today. So when I think of health and care, it's kind of the act of empowering people, putting people in charge of their care and giving them the tools to stay healthy. That's the goal, keeping people healthy. Care is when it doesn't work and they're not healthy, and then we have to get them to a back to health as quickly as possible. So our current system is more of a system of health care that operates more as a sick care system. We wait until people get sick, develop a condition, break a bone, and then we try to help them at that point. What we ought to be doing is building companies that actually support people in their health. That means keeping them healthy, disease prevention, education, easy access, and making sure it's affordable so people can manage their health on a daily basis. Imagine if every day you received a report that said, remember, take your vitamins, get some exercise, do something that makes you happy, um, do all the things that we know keep people healthy and active. And that's really the state we're working to. Right now, we're in a transition state between the current sick care system and a new system empowered by technology that's a system of health and care. If we look at it that way, then health is like, health, then if we separate care and just look at health as, as it is, then there are companies like 8th Leap, which provide daily reports on how your sleep patterns are and all those things. Is that a part of healthcare to our health tech? Well, companies, you're talking about kind of um, different apps that give you information on your current health, on your sleep, on 
various things that you might do. And those actually are very helpful. Even simple things that track the number of steps, they make you more aware of, of how you stay healthy. Like, you know, my watch, my Apple watch, every once in a while says, hey, it's time to stand up. It's a good reminder. Stand up, move around, um, take a walk while you're taking your phone call. So all of those are part of the health equation, what you do to stay healthy, putting you in charge of your numbers. And those are everything from your cholesterol, your blood sugar, everything about you, to how you feel. And all those make up your, your current state of health. Then where does the point between healthcare and health tech like, end? Well, I think health tech or digital health is a component of the overall healthcare industry. You know, we used to have something called digital banking. But today, you would say, well, we just have banking. But banking is digital. They've come together. It's so normal, particularly in India, where I was just two weeks ago. Um, it's so normal to um, just use your phone for almost everything you do and to make payments and the like. I might even argue um, that India may be further along in integrating digital capabilities into everyone's daily life. And uh, from that perspective, um, when we think about healthcare and health tech, today they're separate, but they're coming together just like digital banking, just like travel. You couldn't imagine, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, um, you know, you would get a paper ticket. Today, it's almost unimaginable to think you would go to a travel agent, pick up a paper ticket, and take it to a counter in an airport. No, none of that. You do it all on your phone. Similarly, you know, you order things on your phone. You do everything on your phone. Well, healthcare is moving more and more to your phone. And Transparent, my company, is about how do we make it easier for people to access high quality, affordable health and care. And so what that means is, first and foremost, how do you make it easy for people to stay healthy? How do you make it easy for people to get information? Well, we do that using technology. So in the past, you had health tech or digital health and health care. Today, they're coming together as one experience. And now that doesn't, it's really important, Advic, to say that that doesn't take away from the need to have in-person care. We will always need in-person care, whether it's in therapy, whether it's a doctor and she puts her hands on you to feel a broken bone, to understand that one-on-one -on -one interaction. It's just today we're burying our doctors, our smartest, most experienced, most educated people in paperwork and asking them to do things that they can do but it's a waste of their talent. And what we want to do is use technology to automate that, put people back in charge, and empower not just people, what we call health consumers, but also physicians to make them more productive. So that's really what we want to do. So we see digital health and healthcare becoming one thing just called health and care. Uh how does that change really happen when you have to, when people have to change the intricate things that they do every day? Well, I think that, you know, remember the first, when you look at our mission at Transcarent, what's the first word? How do we make it easy for people to access high quality, affordable health and care? First word, easy. If you make it easier for people to do something, or if you improve the value, then they will do it. Anytime you see people saying, we're going to pay somebody to do something, what they're really saying is it's not valuable enough for them to do it themselves. So let me ask you a question. Do you use Google? Yep. Of course you do. Well, is somebody paying you to use Google? No. Did somebody train you how to use Google? No. It was really easy, and you said, this is really valuable. 
So why isn't healthcare that way? What about if we made healthcare so easy? What about if you could look at your phone and in 60 seconds, you could be chatting with a physician anywhere in the world at any time? Wow, that'd be pretty easy. Well, guess what? That's what we do at Transparent today. What if you could find the highest quality doctor and the highest quality facility for them to practice in anytime you were in charge and you were able to evaluate that doctor, see her or see his record, and make a decision to go to them for your care? Wow, well, that's what we're doing today. But this is all brand new. And in the past, for a lot of reasons, that wasn't available. And one of the things when I spoke recently to a group in India focused on how do we get the two largest democracies in the world, the United States, to work even more closely together. And we already work closely together. When, when I was speaking, one of the things I was saying is that enabling that access um, and making that available everywhere in the world is something that we can work together on. But let's not have India, as it gets up the healthcare curve, make the same mistakes that we made in the United States. Let's have India jump the curve and avoid those mistakes. And because otherwise, India won't be able to afford healthcare for all of its people. Um, and that's really what we have to uh, that what we have to focus on from an India perspective. Uh, but in order to build these companies, there has to be a big enough problem. How does a founder really identify the problem that they really want to solve in a in such an in healthcare as a whole? Well, um, healthcare is very easy, and that is there is a four trillion dollar spend growing to six trillion dollars. And the interesting thing about healthcare is you can't solve the healthcare problem. Impossible. So why do I say that? Because the better we are at keeping people alive, the more people there are and the more problems they have. So in the past, 40 years ago, you didn't have to do hip replacements because nobody lived that long. Now, people are regularly living into their 70s and 80s and things like hips and knees wear out. So that's become, well, it costs money. No matter how good you are, it still costs money to do that. Soon we will replace everything from hearts to all kinds of other things. And we're finding new cures for things that in the past we didn't, we couldn't cure. So from that perspective, the healthcare space is going to continue to grow. What we have to do is figure out how to take out the inefficiencies in healthcare how to provide care for more people, and how to enable people to care for themselves. Um, my family foundation, in association with the American America India Foundation, are working on a program called MANSI. And that program uh, does education for health workers who then go out in rural parts of India and in tribal parts of India and educate women on maternal care. We're looking to educate a million women. Um, that's really important because no matter what we do, if we don't get basic education to those women, we're going to have problems. And so a big part of it is education. How can you educate people? Again, you can use the phone. And so that's a very efficient way to educate people. And that's a big part of our healthcare future. You are training people in rural, rural areas. How do you really educate them properly so that it, it is helpful and they do use it? Well, again, I think like everything, um, you know, education, when we have people who learn things, uh, in most cases, we don't expect that they're going to retain um, all of what we tell them. And so... So we don't expect that they're going to retain everything that we uh, tell them. So, you know, education is about practice. It's about retention. It's about continuing to uh, learn. And we have to make sure that we're doing it. We're meeting people where they are. If they're not very educated, it's our job to make sure we're delivering 
the education at a level that they can understand. There's nothing wrong with that. We all start off uh, at a lower level and education brings us up. But if someone says, I want you to do advanced physics and you're five years old, you may not understand that. So we have to make sure in every case we're delivering education, and this is true in every country, we're delivering education that makes sense to people in their language, with their expressions. And just to give you one example, in the United States, you know, in my last business, Lavongo, it was focused first on diabetes. And we used to go to people in the south part of the United States, and we used to say, well, you have diabetes. And they'd say, I don't have diabetes. We'd say, well, you do because you're using insulin. We know you have diabetes. And uh, they would say, I don't have diabetes. Well, what they called it in the South is a touch of the sugars. And diabetes means you have too much blood sugar, sugar in your blood. It's too high. And rather than saying, I have a disease, it was a lot easier to say, I have a touch of the sugars. And, uh, and that didn't seem so bad. It didn't seem so daunting. And we had to change the way we referred to it. Otherwise, people said, no, nope, I don't have that. And so if you're not culturally sensitive and appropriate, they may not even listen to you. So when you deliver messages, you have to understand, are they being received? You have to test to see if learning is taking place. Those are all things that you need to do uh, if you want to be successful. Definitely, that yeah, love the example. Uh, how does uh, if you're innovating something new, create something new? How does the how should the rollout of the innovation or the innovative product really look like? At what stage do you start the education? I think um, when you talk about, you know, I want to make sure, um, you know, when you talk about healthcare, first and foremost. You know, the potential growth in the industry is very high. Um, and so what we focus on is how do we deliver a consumer experience that really people not just like, they actually love. So again, to go back to your Google experience, Google gives you one box, you type into it, and now increasingly, even if you type the word wrong, it will correct it. It'll say, do you mean this? So the experience is very easy. It's very crisp. If you're using Uber, it's a very good experience, and they put you in charge. So when you get into an Uber, they say, what temperature do you want? Do you want music or not? Do you have a preferred route to take? What kind of car do you want? So they put you in charge. That's a good feeling to be empowered. They have software that makes it easy for you to do what you want to do in terms of ordering or the like. So, so very high potential, but focus first and foremost on creating an experience that's easy, that people trust, that demonstrates value, and that people like. And so make it easy. Make sure they trust it. You have to trust the experience demonstrate value. Do they get value out of it? Does it work? And lastly, then usually it leads to the fourth one, those first three, do they like it? Um, so that's what what um, I would say. I think you know that as a healthcare, healthcare as a whole, you have built healthcare companies, now you're building transparent health and care company. Uh, you have uh, Bluntly, um, you, you're not a doctor. So how do you really identify and build companies which, sur which surround these things with people, which doctors really deal with? Yeah, well, I think when you look at, you know, in any business, and I've been lucky we have, you know, part of my day is focused on transparent. Um, we have a healthcare fund called Seven Wire Ventures. And in Seven Wire Ventures, we have 17 or 18 different separate companies that we fund. And we have technology companies that we fund. Um, we're active in a variety of spaces. And you don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be an expert in any field 
to identify problems. And then the question is, can you come up with innovative solutions for those problems? And, you know, what we've seen in many industries is people in the industries um, don't, they're so ingrained in doing it one way that they don't see the problems. There's an old quote that I like, and I'm, I follow lots of quotes, and it says, we don't know who discovered water, but we're sure it wasn't a fish. And the reality is because a fish takes water for granted, just like we take air for granted. We don't wake up and say, oh, my God. oh wow, this air is amazing. Sometimes if it's dirty, we thank gosh, the air smells. But, but we don't because we take it for granted. But if a Martian came down, it would say, this is amazing. They have this air stuff. It's all around and it blows and it doesn't have any color and they would make all kinds of observations. So sometimes looking from the outside, like physicians, typically they think of healthcare as eight to five. That's when they work. And we say healthcare happens 24 hours a day, just like it does on Amazon. It's 24 hours a day. Um, they call people patients. Um, sometimes they call them in diabetes they used to call people diabetics. Well, imagine if someone labels you, you're a diabetic. They're calling you by a disease name. That's how they refer to you. That doesn't feel good. So we say, no, 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 it's a person. These are people who happen to have diabetes, but they also have lots of other things. They might enjoy cricket. People have a lot to them. So what you call, there's a lot in a name. Um, pretty important stuff. Um, uh, so, so, you know, that's what I think that would be, um, you know, the way, the way I would think about that. If you're building a new healthy company, let's say you are building a new healthy company, uh, what, uh, what would be the first thing you do after you identify a problem that you want to solve? Well, again, I think first, as I was just saying, you, you need to solve a problem. So what is the problem? Is it a big problem? In healthcare in the United States, we have a big problem. One, it's a sick care system. So there's an opportunity to create a system of health and care. Two, we have a cost problem. And, you know, that's it costs too much. Um, three, we have a problem of information and quality. So all those are challenges. If you can come up with a solution that's better than you can build a company around it. And as, as you look at it, if you survey people in the United States, what they would say is healthcare is more confusing, more complex, and more costly than ever before, and it's getting worse, not better. And so from that standpoint, um, how can you address any of those problems? And if you can address all of them, that's even better. Um, so that's what, um, I think that's what, as I look at, how do you find a problem? Well, there's problems all over. There's, you know, upcoming problems. There's new problems coming into every industry. And you see them open the paper, see what the issues are, and then say, can I create a company to solve those? So I think that's what, um, you know, I would, I would look at. Now, for me, I think there's a second piece of that, and that is I want to work on uh, big problems. So some people, you know, you might decide to open a restaurant, and your goal might be I want to provide great food to people in this community that's affordably priced. And that might be awesome for you and makes you happy. You're doing a great job. You make a good living. <clears throat> that's fine for some people. For me, um, I want to work on bigger problems. And so these are problems that affect millions of people. So that's number one. Number two, I want to work on problems that are inspiring, that really make a difference in people's lives. Some people might make glass jars. That's important. We need glass jars. That's just not for me. So I've chosen healthcare as one area, and that's a personal challenge. And I look to that 
for inspiration. What inspires me? What makes me wake up every day and say, I can't wait to get at this? And if you know, I can address this issue, I can help change the world just a little bit. When you think about in all scripts, we wrote hundreds of millions of electronic prescriptions every year. Those were safer. They prevented people from drug interactions. They prevented deaths of people. And we knew we made the world better because of that. It was also lower cost and more efficient. And so that changed the world. In diabetes, more than a million people wake up every day and they're healthier because of Lavanga. That's something that everybody who worked there is really proud of. And they loved that experience. They didn't just like it. They loved it. So can you create a great company as one that takes care of the people it serves? Number one, that takes care of the people who pay for that care. So that might be their employers. That takes care of the people who work at the company. That takes care of the community. And last but not least, that rewards its investors. And that's kind of the hierarchy. So care for the people, care for their clients, care for the people who deliver the care, the employees, the community that you operate in, and lastly, the investors. That's a great company. And that's what you know. I'm focused on building. So you got to look for what inspires you. And um, the, one of the benefits is lived experience. Look at your own life. In my life, um, my youngest son has type 1 diabetes. And so I saw how hard we made it for people with diabetes who just wanted to stay healthy. We made it hard for them to stay healthy. We should make it easy for them to stay healthy. And I worked very hard and continue to work on finding a cure for diabetes. But until we do, we have to keep people healthy. Diabetes, as you know, is an enormous problem in India. So how do we keep people healthy until we can find a cure? And that is a huge problem. And that was a worthy problem to attack and to go after, to remove the hurdles we put in front of people. And I knew there was a better way. And that was informed in part by lived experience. So one of the things we look for when we invest in people, we have a great company called NoCD. And it's, it's the letter N in front of OCD. And OCD is a big challenge for a lot of people, obsessive compulsive disorder. This young entrepreneur who had OCD, he created this company. Well, no one knew better how debilitating it can be if untreated. And he wanted to find a better way. He was so inspired that we invested in him. We backed him and he's built a great company. So, you know, starting transparent. I knew we weren't done fixing healthcare, but we were just getting started. Some people after Lavango, they were exhausted. I was inspired. I was energized. I said, if we can fix it for diabetes and other chronic conditions, we can fix all of this. Yeah, it's going to be tough. It's going to be bumpy. It's not going to be pretty, but we can do it. We demonstrated we can do it. And that's what inspires me every day to, you know, go forward and drive and get to a better spot. Uh, yeah, so the inspiration is important. You, you talked about uh, investing there. I'll pick you on the uh, investing that part. Uh, most, like most investors, some of our operators, some some start a VC fund or different things. You, ha you have our experience in both you have built an incredible company and are investing now from your fund. Uh, is there a difference between how you build the company versus how you look in the found look at it when you invest? Uh, one question I like to ask people is I say, what is your exit strategy? Yeah. And if they have an exit strategy, we tend not to invest. And that seems kind of odd. But we want people who are so committed, like I mentioned, this great founder, Stephen Smith, he wants to solve this problem. He's not concerned about exiting. He's not concerned about, I want to do an IPO and lead with a lot of money. He wants to solve 
and address this issue of OCD, just like with diabetes, I'm not done until there's a cure. Period, full stop. Every year we raise money. We're looking for a cure. We're giving away money. We're doing everything we can until there's a cure. So um, Bill Gates had a great quote. And someone asked him about, you know, when he's going to stop. And he said, if there was a finish line, don't you think I would have crossed it by now? So, you know, I mean, the issue is when we sold Lavango for $18.5 billion, some people said, aren't you done? Done? We're just getting started. We have a whole healthcare system to address in the United States and then around the rest of the world because people aren't getting the care that they need all across the world. How do we make that efficient so everybody can get care? So until we do that, um, I've got I've got a big job, and uh, I'm happy to uh, continue to focus on that. You know that said, when we're looking to invest, you know in companies, uh, you know we're looking for great people. We're looking for people who have lived experience. Um, you know, because now you've identified the problem. And so you say you need great people. Um, you need people who are focused on learning. Um, you have to treat them and provide them with the appropriate incentives. And, uh, and then you have to have people who are committed to the vision. You know, they have to be really deeply motivated to change lives. That's why we work in healthcare, um, because it's not easy, um, and it doesn't happen overnight. Biz Stone, the founder of Twitter, said the definition of an overnight success is 10 years of hard work and one overnight. And uh, uh, so, you know, again, that was the story of Twitter. And, but it, it's the story of all great companies. If you look at Apple... I mean, think about what happened at Apple. The founder got thrown out. The founder came back. They had to borrow money from Microsoft. Their, their big competitor loaned them money. And the only reason Microsoft did that was antitrust. They wanted a competitor. <laughs> and so all of those things, almost unimaginable. And yet today we think of it as a great company. Um, Amazon, Jeff Bezos was told by the lead analyst that he should stick to books and stop doing all this other stuff. Well, lucky for all of us, he didn't. So, you know, people who think they're being helpful or sometimes they're not trying to be helpful, give you advice along the way, and you have to be deeply committed to get these things done. And that's no different than transparent. You know, there will be people who just get exhausted, who say along the way, maybe it's not possible. Maybe we can't fix healthcare. That's okay. Um, but that's not me, and that's not what company's going to do. How much of your investing uh, that you said you don't ask or you don't believe that founders should tell them or should have an exit plan? How much of that is really philosophical versus just... Because VC funds need exits in order to make money. How does that really correlate with what you said? Well, again, you don't need to make money um, there's a lot of ways to do that without exiting. So lots of companies uh, have started and make money along the way. You can pay dividends. You can go private and continue to run the company. There's a lot of ways to take investors out to give investors return without having to leave and exit. And we don't mind an exit strategy but an exit strategy for someone who comes in and says, I want to do an IPO, you don't know if you can do an IPO, no matter how good the company is. The market has to be right. The timing has to be right. You have to have the right team. And then being a public company requires a lot of energy that you don't necessarily really want to do if you're focused on solving the problem. So from that perspective, um, you have to make sure that the founder is committed to a long-term vision, not just looking for, because, you know, 
people think an IPO is glamorous. And I always tell people because I've done, I've been lucky enough to do four of them and leave three, leave three of them. That is the best day of the IPO is the day you IPO. And after that, it's all downhill. And the reason it is all of a sudden you have thousands of bosses who think they know how to run the company better than you every day. And it's an up and a down and somebody's evaluating you in a very public way. So something happens, somebody says something, the stock goes down, and all of a sudden, everybody you see says, hey, what's going on? Like, running the company just like I did yesterday, but, but it's a very different kind of environment. So that's what happens. Then why do founders really, or companies really, in fact, go public if most of it is negative? Well, I don't know that it's negative. It's just different. It can be negative. It can be challenging. It's getting increasingly hard. But the reason, why do you do an IPO? First and foremost, today an IPO is a branding event. So, you know, being public gets you a lot of publicity. There's a lot of sexiness about it. And uh, and people generally think public companies are kind of better funded. But that's the second piece, which is it makes capital easier. So when you go public, you generally get a capital infusion. It can be less dilutive than getting money privately. The third piece is if you're going to do acquisitions, now your stock is valued. If I'm a private company and I want to buy your company, well, what's my company worth? Well, no one really knows. But if you're public, you know exactly. Now you have a currency to trade stock in. I can give you this, and you know what it's worth. And if you believe in the future, you think it's going to go up. So those are some of the reasons to go public. Why not go public? It's harder to invest. The public doesn't always understand the strategy. For example, if I said to the public, I want to spend $7 million to build a new AI technology, and but it's going to hit my earnings, the public wouldn't like that. And because of automated trading now, some if my earnings go down, even if it's for a really good reason, some really big holders of my stock may have to sell the stock. It's not even their choice. It's done in an automated way. Versus if I go out and spend 10 times that amount, $70 million to buy a company, that's perfectly fine. And that doesn't make any sense, but that's how the public markets work. So the same technology that would cost me $7 million to build if I buy it. Now, if I was private, i just build it. But being public, i got to really think about that um, you know, because I've got to understand what's the implications to shareholders and the like. How does going public really work, actually? Well, I think the, the way it works is so, so when you start a company... You might start the company, like you started this podcast, you have a little bit of money and you start doing it. And then you want to expand it. So you go out to people and you say, will you invest in my company? I'm going to value it at a million dollars and I'll sell you 20%. You give me $200,000. So they do. Now you use up that $200,000 and you go to another group of people and you say, you're going to be series B preferred. First 200 was Series A preferred. What that means is you as Series B get your money back before the Series A people do and before I do. Now you go and you say, okay, now I want to do Series C because you used up that money. But at a certain point when the company is successful, you might say, um, I want to do, um, now I want to do an IPO. So you might go out and get a banker, and that's where you're offering your stock to public, the general public. So you go to NAT, one of the big exchanges, and you say, I want to offer this. You have to follow a lot of accounting rules and the like, and then the public can buy your stock. And if the value was a million dollars, then and you issue a million shares, every share is a dollar. But as the company gets more valuable, those share prices go up. So that's the good news. The problem is that the public market, especially for larger companies, watches a number of metrics. They say, how fast are you growing? What should they value at? 
Did you lose any senior executives? What's happening around you in the market? Are there neat competitors? And all those things can hit the value of your stock, even if you're doing just fine. So there's a lot more inputs. There's a lot more valuation to happen. Knowing everything you know today, would you still have uh, taken the company public? Um, of course, yeah, I would have. But we were very fortunate to, you know, you can take the company public and get the timing right. We got the timing perfect in all scripts. Um, we got the timing perfect at Lavango. Um, but I will also say that in all scripts, when we went out, we took the company public, we had a great run. And then in 1999, the market collapsed. And stock that was $89, you could now buy for $2. Think about that. So, so, you know, that was very challenging to manage through that time. Luckily, we were capitalized well, so we could. But a lot of companies didn't survive that market drop. So you have to be very careful. And if you want to go public, you just have to know what you're doing. And that usually means getting a lot of experienced folks. There's a lot of companies in the healthcare space um, who, uh, who literally didn't, you know, went out, went public, and then the next quarter they missed their numbers because when you're public, you get people, here's what we're going to do the next quarter, the next year, and you have to, you have to deliver. And if you don't, your stock's going to get hit. So they didn't understand that. They didn't understand how much time it takes to be public. Um, so those are all really important aspects of what you do, and you just have to be ready. Most companies are not. So that's where you need very good advisors. Yeah. I'll, I'll just uh, ask one uh, like personal question that I think I've faced, and I was just curious. Uh, a lot of times, like I've had a couple of founders who have taken their company public on the podcast, some that I've reached out to. Uh, what, uh, why do they have restriction, so much restriction on where they speak and what they speak? I've, like You have to talk to hundreds of comms people to just get them on. Why is that? You know, when you're public, there's a lot of people who hold your stock. And so if I was public and I said my stock's going to go up, and then a lot of people go out and buy my stock, and the stock doesn't go up, then, then I can get sued because I gave public information that wasn't accurate. So, and people can read into that. If I say I'm about to do an acquisition, and then I don't do the acquisition because it falls through, you know, that can lead to litigation. And then the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, also um, has certain rules. You can't write before an earnings release or write after an earnings release. They're called quiet periods. You can't trade the stock because they're concerned. If I knew that my numbers were not going to be good, and then all of a sudden I sold the stock before I reported, that's not legal. So there's a quiet period um, before and up to your earnings. So there's a lot of rules, and that's just another example of why don't go public unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, I've been into startups and VC since I was 11. What do you think is one fact that will blow 11-year-old me, Mike? Um. Look, I think that you have to, everyone should focus on doing what they love. And if you do what you love, it's not work. It's fun. I don't go to work. People say I work a lot of hours. I don't think I work at all. I love what I do. I love the people that I do it with. I love meeting new people. I love solving problems. I love learning. All those things, I get to do those every day with great people. And that's, to me, that's part of the adventure. And whether it's, you know, people talk about work-life separation. I don't believe in that because that implies that one is better than the other. I like to, everything I do, I like to jump in. I like to make it a learning experience. I like to make sure that in every case uh, that I'm doing things that I love to do, um, that I'm doing them in ways that, that you know I can be proud of and that I'm giving it my all 
So, you know, what I would advise your listeners is do what you love to do. You know, it's very funny because um, Tony Hawk, the famous skateboarder, his parents said, you know, stop skateboarding, go get a regular education. He said, I love doing this. And he became a multimillionaire doing skateboards. Why? He loved it. He had so much passion for it. He knew how to do it better. And that gets back to that idea of lived experience. What's your experience? You know, sometimes people take a negative experience. Maybe they have diabetes and they turn it into a positive. You know, they go out and create a website. They invent something new. They know that so well. And the other thing I'd say is that it's um, there's a famous entrepreneur inventor named Dean Kamen, K-A-M-E-N. And he invented the wheelchair that walks up steps, and he invented the Segway and the, the insulin pump, and amazing, Dean Kamen. And Dean says his whole life, people told him, yeah, it's two steps forward, but one step back. And people would say that as if it was a negative. And he said he never understood that because two steps forward and one step back is still one step forward. And so for entrepreneurs, you should assume that that is always two steps forward and one step back. Sometimes learning is about trying things and they don't work. Thomas Edison, before he invented the light bulb, he said, I found a thousand things that wouldn't work. He didn't say I failed. He said I found he was in the experiment mode. So I would advise people to say, You know, people say, tell me about your biggest failure. I say, I haven't had any failures. They think that's arrogant. No, I've had a lot of learning, (laughs) but that's not a failure. As long as you learn, even what not to do, as long as you learn, you're getting better every day. And that's what you got to remember. So thank you. It's been great to talk to you. And uh, congratulations on your podcast. Congratulations on all the work you're doing. We'll keep following you and let's stay in touch. Thanks to all your listeners today.